It is Thursday, September 14th, 2017. We're in Athens, Georgia. This is the two-party Georgia Oral History Program sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library uh, for Political Research and Studies. My name is Ashton Ellett and I'm here with Mayor Rusty Paul, Mayor of Sandy Springs, Georgia. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me over. Very, very, very exciting. Very glad to have you here. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your, your upbringing okay. in, in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, I grew up just outside Birmingham, about 40 miles north in a little town called Aniana, uh, which everybody teasingly said was Cherokee for the end of the trail. And then we lived about three more miles out. I've heard a few towns. Trail. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that joke. <laughs> I don't know what Aniana really means, but it, it was a great story. Right. Grew up there on a farm. It's been in my family for several generations, in fact, still there. Uh, went to a small rural school, uh, Appalachian, uh, from third grade when we moved there until I graduated from high school. Uh, went to Birmingham Southern for two years, then transferred to Samford. Um, I had your typical Southern kid uh, childhood growing up on a farm, hunting and doing all the fishing and camping and doing all the things that you know kids do on, on farms. But it was a, a very turbulent time. This is the 19, really the 1960s uh, in, in Alabama when uh, the Civil Rights era was uh, at its height. And uh, I was one of those kids who would sit on the porch. Everybody sat out on the front porch because it's too hot inside. Mm -hmm. and, and all the adults talked. And I listened to the conversations about uh, what was going on in Birmingham, which was a short distance away. And my dad's parents lived in Birmingham, and I spent a lot of time with them uh, when I was growing up. And my grandmother didn't drive. Right. So we, we took the Birmingham bus system into downtown Birmingham, which is where everybody shopped at the time. And I'm old enough to remember people getting up and moving to the back of the bus so that we could sit down. I remember I was old enough that I could read. I could read mm -hmm. the white and the colored signs on the water fountains in the restrooms. And, you know, you, but I was, a, I was a young child, seven, eight years old, sure. and uh, never thought to question things too much. But in that growing up in Birmingham, you know, those places were not, uh, they're not historical for me. They're, they're places that I knew, the Kelly Ingram Park. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a photographer and he, um, he carried his film to a little uh, photo shop on the west side of Birmingham that was owned by a gentleman by the name of Chris McNair. Chris's daughter, Denise, was one of the four girls killed in the 16th yep. Street church bombing. So these right. are people I knew and grew up with. And uh, so when we talk about the civil rights era, you know, it's not something that I, it, it's personal with me because of, of growing up in that location at that time, knowing people involved. Uh, when I was in uh, college, I worked um, at a company called Tractor and Equipment Company, which is on Airport Highway in Birmingham, mm -hmm. which I looked out my window at the Aero Marine store where James Earl Ray bought the rifle that he assassinated Dr. King with. So again, these were places that, that I, I saw in my everyday life. So right. I, I grew up in an, an, uh, uh, in an environment where politics was always talked about. I'll never forget when I was, my, my mom had a standing uh, hair appointment in town every Saturday morning and I went with her and I had two hours of, of unrestrained freedom to walk the streets. And one, um, one Saturday I heard a bluegrass band up by the courthouse and I walked up to the courthouse mm -hmm. and sure enough they were playing and all the farmers and their wives were showing up and I stayed around and then a black Ford drove up and uh, a guy who I had heard an awful lot about but never had seen before in person, George C. Wallace jumped mm -hmm. out jumped up on the, uh, that flatbed and gave a speech, the first political speech that I ever sat and listened to. And in the middle of his speech, he, uh, he got in to start talking about what, as governor, he had done for the folks in Blunt County, Alabama, which is where it was. And he just kind of quietly, didn't miss a beat, reached behind him, and an aide gave him a piece of paper, and he read off all these things that, that he had done, then he handed the paper back, and I probably couldn't have been more than 12 to 14 years old at the time. And I just thought, how cynical. <laughs> he had no clue what he had done if he hadn't had that piece of paper. Uh, I mean, that doesn't mean that he probably shouldn't have taken credit for it, but it's, it, it stuck with me. And I uh, 
was a voracious reader of the newspapers at that time. My parents didn't take a newspaper, but my grandmother did, and she lived about a tenth of a mile away. And I walked from our house to her house and, and when school was out, and I read the newspaper every day. And it also helped that she saved me a biscuit uh, from, bre from their <laughs> breakfast that, uh, that I enjoyed as well. So I was reading and got very interested and really kind of almost consumed by the political aspects of things that were going on in the civil rights era in, in Alabama and in, in and around uh, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And as I say, sitting on the front porch of a farmhouse listening to the adults talk about it, and nobody in my family were big uh, admirers of Dr. King at the time. Uh, they were white, rural farmers, yeoman sure. farmers, sure. Uh, and uh, uh, very conservative. Uh, so you kind of absorb that conversation and information. But there was also, I, I was also, uh, at a very early age, started drawing my own conclusions and thinking for myself, which sometimes got me into trouble. But, uh, but I was consumed by politics uh, and what was going on at that time. Now, were your family, uh, family members, Democrats? By they heritage, all were Democrats right? at that point. Now, you know, you hear a lot about the poll tax being utilized to prevent African Americans from voting. Mm -hmm. It was also a tool that they used to keep poor white Absolutely. people from voting. My mom didn't vote, and we weren't poor. And the poll tax was only three dollars a year, as I recall. But they didn't have a lot of money just lying around and it to go. Accumulated yeah, every year, yeah, so you had to pay arrears. So, yeah. my mom didn't vote till I was an, almost an adult when the poll really? tax was 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 taken away. I had the rest of my family. Very few of them voted. My grandparents did, uh, and but I had an aunt who worked on the farm all her life, picking cotton at three, three and a half cents a pound. She picked three hundred pounds of cotton a day, and for ten bucks, there wasn't three bucks left over, you no. know, for uh, to do those sorts of things. So uh, all those things had an impact on me. Um, I voted in one election before I left the state of Alabama, and I stayed just long enough to vote one last time against George Wallace. It was something about th that experience of encountering him at that courthouse that had an impact on me. And, and, and I came to understand growing up in Birmingham how much political leadership matters. Right. Because Birmingham and Atlanta, we'll take those two examples, were about the same size in the 1950s. In fact, Birmingham was growing much faster. It's called the Magic City. It's the only place on the planet where you have the three elements made to make steel, iron, iron ore, limestone, and coal, mm -hmm. and they're right there. Uh, and so it was growing very rapidly. It was a multicultural. You had a lot of Greeks, Italians, as well as you know uh, uh, the rest of us and, and African Americans. And so it was a very multicultural environment there uh, and was very successful. But the difference between Birmingham and Atlanta 50, 60 years later was political leadership. It was the difference between Bull Connor and George Wallace and uh, uh, Ivan Allen and Carl Sanders. Mm -hmm. And 50 years later, there was something about that period that I understood that political leadership in Alabama were making huge mistakes that were gonna have long-term consequences. And so those were the influences that got me involved. And so when I came, uh, graduated from college and came to Georgia uh, and was an adult and had my first real job, I really wanted to get get involved in the political process. And so that's kind of, those were the, the early forces that shaped me. And when people say, well, how does somebody with kind of your sensibilities become a Republican? I said, well, Took the question right it's, out it's, 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 it's George Wallace and Bull Connor were the Democrats mm -hmm. in the area where I grew up. And if you wanted to do something, if you wanted to do something positive and different, if you wanted to get outside the mainstream or change the mainstream, you had to do it in the opposite party, and so that's why I was uh, that's why I was drawn to be a Republican at an early age. How do you think you you, you rationalize that? Do you, do you uh, define yourself as a conservative, a political conservative? I am kind of. It's it's interesting, and now that I'm at the end of my political career, I can <laughs> say some of these things that I've thought for a long time. I'm really the 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 antithesis of what Churchill said. Churchill said that if you're not a liberal when you're young, you have no. Uh, heart, and if you're not a conservative when you're old, you have no brains. My political journey has kind of been the opposite direction. I was probably okay. much more conservative younger, okay. growing up around the people that I grew up in, the environment that I yeah. grew up in, 
And then I've kind of evolved over time and realized that the world is not black and white, it's more gray. Uh, and that's kind of why in today's world with uh, you know, the hyper-partisanship that's existing in what I'll call the Trump era, uh, I'm somewhat a fish out of water because I don't feel comfortable. I feel much more comfortable working on solutions which are kind of toward the center. I'm still right of center. I'm still very traditional in my thinking, uh, even though my kids are dragging me, kicking and screaming <laughs> into the 21st century, having five kids, uh, three of whom are millennials, uh, you know, they have a, a slightly different mindset. Uh, and so uh, I've evolved probably am, am more tolerant, more um, aware that the world is more gray than it is black and white. Right. And so I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm something of a fish out of water in today's political world where we have this hyper-partisanship, sharply divided world that, uh, that causes me real concern. So we'll come back to the, the present okay. a little bit, but I want to I want to sort of get a handle on your introduction to Republican politics here in Georgia. Uh, it's interesting. I was, I, as I said, I was kind of a Republican when I got here. I moved to Georgia right after graduating from college in 1974. Okay. And uh, was looking to get involved. And then Jimmy Carter announced that he was running for president. I thought, oh, this would be fun. Let me get involved in a presidential campaign. And I sent a letter to the Carter campaign. If it had been answered, my, my life probably would be <laughs> much different. And I understand now the chaos of a campaign, why that all letters don't get answered. Uh, but I was very disappointed. I never heard anything back from, uh, from the Carter campaign. So I went out looking for a campaign to get involved in. And I was going to church. I, 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 when I first moved to Georgia, I was living in what was then Avondale Estates. Mm -hmm. It's kind of mm -hmm. Memorial Drive. It's literally right behind what became the very first Home Depot. And I was going to Avondale First Baptist Church, and I'm walking through the parking lot looking at the political stickers. And there was one there for a guy by the name of Jim Armstrong. And it turned out that he went to church there, and I asked some people in church. I said, tell me about Jim Armstrong. Is he Republican or Democrat? He said, he's a Republican. So I said, well, why don't you ask him to give me a call? I'd like to work in his campaign. I, another time, didn't get a phone call. And I went back a couple of weeks later and uh, saw the same person. I said, well, you know, I never got a phone call. He said, oh, I forgot. And that Sunday afternoon in uh, probably 1974, maybe it was 74, 76, probably 70, 76, I guess. Yeah, it was 76. I got a phone call from a guy by the name of Jim Kelly. He said, I understand you want to help in our campaign. I said, yeah. I said, well, we got a campaign meeting this afternoon, 2 o'clock. Can you be there? I said, I'll be there. It was a Sunday afternoon. And I showed up at Jim's house and uh, started helping in his campaign. He was running for the DeKalb County Commission uh, against a, a guy uh, who was a, an incumbent. Uh, and uh, so I just got involved, fell in and got involved in, in, in his campaign. And that was my entree into Republican politics uh, in 1976, working for commission chairman. And then it kind of, you know, the, the great thing about the Republican Party at that time, there were no, it, it was a relatively uncrowded field. And so as a young person, you could do things that you might not be able to do in the Democratic Party at that time. And you could move up the ranks real right. quickly. So uh, I was able to take advantage of that lack of competition to kind of start moving up. And this is at a time when DeKalb County is really sort of the, the stronghold, it if was. you were, it if was. you will, it was. Uh, for the Republican Party. In fact, South DeKalb, you had mm -hmm. uh, was probably a stronger Republican area at that time than North DeKalb. Mm -hmm. uh, you had two you, two factions operating in South DeKalb. Uh, Tom Davidson, who what was called the Hardware Gang, the Hardware that met, Gang, that's that right, at his hardware store, and Jim, and his little faction were uh, were, were different, and I kind of just by accident fell in with them. And um, so, yeah, and, and we, had, uh, we had three members of the state house. We had justices of the peace. We had a member of the Senate, uh, a couple of commission members. Uh, so uh, uh, it was a real stronghold at that time. Was that Harry Geisinger? Who well, no, Harry, Harry was kind of in the middle part. He was around Tucker in that area. You That's had right. Walt That's Davis, right. Tommy Talbert. And then, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember who the third one was, and then they kind of shifted things around. Mm -hmm. We had Don Butler, Tommy, and Walt. And uh, George Warren was a state senator at that time. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was a very dominant Republican area in the state. One of the few places where you had to run as a Republican to win. 
Mm -hmm. uh, even though there was still a very strong Democratic Party, you had people like Hugh Jordan from Stone Mountain, who was in, one of the leadership. Uh, in, and so, but it was, it was a very competitive area, but largely Republican at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we could, we could win elections down there. We did. I learned, I mean, learned the basics of, you know, going, of retail politics, going door to door. We didn't have a lot of money, so we stuffed envelopes, we stuffed mailboxes, we'd, we'd follow the postman through the neighborhoods trying to find <laughs> just stuff literature in to make it look like we'd mailed it. So uh, we were, it was, it was guerrilla politics at its best. Well, the, the statute of limitations is pro yeah, uh, probably up on that one. Yeah, I'm, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably end up confessing to a lot of things before it's no. over. Um, so, so you, you're involved in local politics, mm -hmm. a very, very grassroots right. introduction. Right. Um, so, how do you work your? And, and you've already mentioned that you know the party wasn't large yeah. um, or necessarily complex right. at that time. So, how do you make your sort of forays into the state party? You know, sort of <sighs> well, it wasn't a very difficult, difficult move. I mean, Jim Armstrong was my first mentor in politics, and so. Um, you know, he, he, he ran and was elected as DeKalb County chairman. And so uh, I got to the opportunity to not only just work in his campaign, I was, I was helping run other campaigns. I learned how to okay. manage campaigns. And in fact, I went to Georgia State to get my master's degree in, in uh, uh, campaigns and elections. That was what I thought I'd do for the rest of my life is just run, run campaigns. Sure. Uh, so um, with that kind of skill and talent, with a, not a lot of people specializing in that sort of thing, it was it was fairly easy, and I had some great mentors. Of course, during that time in 1977, I ran for the uh, city council in Stone Mountain, and won. Um, and to the, my surprise and everybody else's, uh, including the mayor of, uh, <laughs> of Stone Mountain, Randolph Medlock, who was also a great mentor to me. He was a very strong Democrat, uh, but uh, but took a liking to me and and really helped me along. So I was able to, to do that. And then when Matt Patton became uh, party chairman, uh, our, group, our little faction had uh, supported his opponent in the state party race. And uh, Matt was a very wise guy, taught me a lot. He was one of those folks who believed in, in, in co-opting his opposition, bringing them in sure. and making them a part. And so he, I had a, I, I had a journalism degree. My, uh, I was working for a small trade publication in Decatur at the time. And he wanted to do a statewide newspaper. So he, uh, he asked me to, to put the newspaper together. So I did for the state party. It was the Republican. We put the emphasis on the C-A-N part, Republicans can. And so for the, the two years that Matt was, uh, was chairman, uh, I, I uh, did the uh, state party newspaper, and that was my first real entree into state level okay. politics. And I got to know people like Bob Shaw, Mac Mattingly, obviously, uh, Coverdale, all those folks at the t at the, that were kind of real active at the top of the party at the time. I began to get kind of uh, ingratiated, if you will, into that. I worked uh, as the um, press aide to the uh, five member. Senate Republican delegation, <laughs> <laughs> which covered Senator Coverdale, Senator Bob Bell, Jim Tysinger, uh, Haskey, Brantley, and George Warren. Okay. <laughs> and then later, we had uh, one come in from, from uh, Columbus, um, oh. and we had six of them. So uh, I, I was kind of their press aide. We worked in the little, little offices on the mezzanine of the Capitol. And so that was kind of my entree into to state level politics. So you're, you're getting involved. So uh, Matthew Patton was chair 79 to early 81. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're coming out of the 1970s, which is about as low as the right. Georgia Republican right. Party had been right. since. Well, Watergate. Watergate yeah. really kicked the state party in the teeth. We had been somewhat ascendant and then. Sure. During uh, the, the early 70s, 72 to 76, really, yeah, with that Carter. was what I call the Watergate era. Then we had Carter running, and there was a huge amount of, of uh, uh, statewide pride in Carter. I don't know that he could have gotten reelected governor at that time, but he was very, <laughs> everybody said, well, having a you know, president from the state of Georgia probably be a good thing. So uh, that period from really Watergate all the way into at least the middle part of the Carter administration 
it was a very, very difficult period for the state Republican Party. I went to see, I did a lot of press relations. I went to see David Norton, who was the political editor for the uh, Constitution or the journal, one of the two. They were two newspapers. I think yeah, believe it's two different newspapers at the time. And I went in to talk to him about, you know, why, why don't you cover the Republican Party? And he was very, very blunt. He said, look, the Republican Party in Georgia is irrelevant. It has always been irrelevant. And as far as I know, it will always be irrelevant. And, and so there's no reason for me to cover you. If you ever become relevant, then I'll call. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. That was kind of the media uh, attitude toward the Republican Party. And I could somewhat understand it. We were not a factor. Uh, we had 25 members of 180 uh, House delega uh, delegation, mm -hmm. and we had five members of a 56 delegation Senate uh, uh, body, and we were we were irrelevant. I mean, the Democrats controlled. When I moved to Georgia, the Democrats controlled all the they had super majorities in the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. All the statewide elected officials right. were male Democrats. And then after the Republicans took control, the Republicans had a supermajority in both houses. We had all statewide offices, all white males at the time. And I looked back and said, you know, we haven't changed Georgia politics at all. We just changed the label. Uh, and uh, that was... <laughs> It was insightful to me and a little disappointing, I think, but, uh, you know, that's kind of the way th things turned out. Well, I mean, we're, we're talking 1978, Rodney yeah. Cook, mm -hmm. who was a rising star right. within the Republican Party, right. by 1978 offered pro forma uh, a challenge right. to, to George Busby and stuff like that. But 1980, 1980 rolls around, right. the, the Reagan campaign. Mm -hmm. what, what did Ronald Reagan, what, what did that, that Republican primary, that Republican campaign well, mean it, to the party? It, 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 it was it's really, a, in my, my analysis of it, it was really two things happened. Sure. One, Carter ran as a different kind of Democrat. The Democrats had always said in Georgia, we're not like the national Democrats, we're conservative, we have the real values, mm -hmm. and so we're, we're different. We're not like those, we're not the Ted Kennedy, Massachusetts, Northeast, liberal Democrats. We're different. <laughs> Carter, by governing left of center, and he, I, I know he had to because he was a Democrat and he had to get the, the, those Democrats to support him, really soured a lot of Southerners who had supported him, conservative Southern Democrats. So they were very disillusioned going into the middle part of Carter's term. So that, that, that was part of the glue coming loose on the Democratic coalition in the South. Carter had a real impact. And then you had Ronald Reagan, who was very conservative, spoke like we all, like most Southerners hoped Carter would talk and govern. Uh, and so you had a real shift between 1976 and 1980 in Republican politics. As I say, souring on the promise that I think a lot of Southern conservative Democrats mm -hmm. had with Carter. And here comes this new guy who, who spoke their language. Good looking guy. The women just, I mean, women everywhere. Uh, you, you'd go to a Reagan rally and the women would just cry out up trying to get a little bit of touch his hand, whatever, <laughs> uh, and created excitement. And uh, uh, so you began that, that glue that held the Democratic coalition together really started coming apart in about 1978, in Georgia particularly, but in, around the rest of the South, okay. because of those two, the, the confluence of disappointment over Jimmy Carter and the opportunity that Reagan presented to Southerners who were basically very conservative, but he was a non-threatening conservative. He didn't... He wasn't a Tom Watson kind of <laughs> down the, you know, Re reaching back. Uh, yeah, uh, he was. He he didn't. He was not threatening uh, to those moderate and right of center Democrats who had always mm -hmm. been concerned about, uh, you know, the Republican Party going back to, you know, to the Civil War, uh, and so uh, those two things I think really began to change. The, the dynamic of, of the two-party system, and particularly in Georgia, but really across the whole South. So C Carter um, loses in 1980, mm -hmm. carries Georgia. Yep. Um, Mac Mattingly is elected, right. barely, yeah. uh, but is elected. Mm -hmm. 
What did that mean for, for Georgia, for the, for the Georgia Republican Party? Uh, a lot, and it created some tensions, too. It, uh, first of all, I'll never forget where I was when on, I was listening to, I was coming back from the Reagan headquarters after Reagan had won, and I lived in Stone Mountain. I pulled into the, the carport at probably about 2 o'clock in the morning, I guess. It was very, very late. Yeah, it and when, when, when WSB announced uh, on radio that, uh, that McMaddingly had won, and uh, I mean, that was kind of a shock. I don't think <laughs> even those of us who uh, had you were not there, expecting. I was not expecting it. I'm not even sure Mac was expecting it, <laughs> but he won. And uh, for the first time, we had a, a, a Republican senator, and that really changes the dynamics. Right. We had Republican members of the House, you know, Callaway, uh, Fletcher Thompson, uh, Ben Blackburn, people like that. Uh, so, but a senator changes the whole dynamic uh, because it changes the relationship mm -hmm. between uh, the party uh, and the White House. I mean, we had those of us who'd been involved in the 80 Reagan campaign, we, you know, we thought we'd get all the appointments and all that sort of thing. All of a sudden now we've got to go through a Republican senator who did, was not part of that organization. And there was a tremendous, I mean, there was a tremendous... Um, amount of tension between Senator Mattingly and uh, the Reagan organization, uh, particularly as they were trying to figure out who, you know, what staff positions would get a tremendous amount of stress. Uh, and um, the White House was like, a, if, when it came to Georgia, they were like a duck in a shooting gallery. They're just back and forth. They, they know they've got to have the senator. They need him. They can't just ignore him, but they've got all these loyalists down there that's worked for for. President Reagan for a decade or more, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, they couldn't just walk away from him. So it was a very delicate balance that the White House had. The White House really ended up negotiating between Ted Stivers, who was the chairman right. of the Reagan uh, organization in Georgia, and, and his wife was, was awful. Wife, which very she came. So it was, and and so it was a it was very interesting period to be. I was offered a position in. Um, Civil, Civil Air and Art and Nautics Board, and I was like 26, 27 years old. I thought, man, I'm not old enough to go to Washington to do that. Then when I ended up there later, I found out the place is run by 20-year-olds. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and so, I mean, the, the, they worked it out. They kind of split up the, the various positions. Ted got his fair share, and Mattingly got his fair share, and they worked it out. But it was, it was, a, it was a very stressful, oh, sure. tension-filled time. In the Republican Party, as we, which kind of brought out all those old rivalries that had existed for decades. Right, right. So, what was your experience during the, the Reagan administration? So, eighty one to, we'll, we'll talk about eighty eight election yeah. a little well, bit. Well, I was, I was, uh, like I say, I was offered, I was given a choice of a couple of positions in the Reagan administration. Ted really wanted me to go. Uh, I had a young family, uh, just starting my my own career. Uh, and I decided, no, I don't think so. I, I thought I wasn't old enough to go and be making heavy decisions in the federal, federal government anyway. I, and so um, I, I, I declined, um, thanked him for the opportunity. Um, and I, I'm not really disappointed that I didn't take the opportunities. I think it was the right decision for me at the time. But I kind of stayed involved. In, in the 84 reelect. none of us who had been part of the Reagan operation right. in 80 were invited back. They put together a completely new uh, group, George Israel mm -hmm. and uh, Mattingly and, and Coverdale. Those folks kind of usurped over that period uh, the leadership role that Ted Stivers and Jim Armstrong and a lot of my uh, mentors. So I, I didn't have much to do with the 84 reelect. Uh, I was still on the city council. I was running a few statewide, or not statewide races, but local races for the legislature and things like that. Uh, a state legislator by the name of Tommy Talbert was an enormous mentor for me. He he was a lieutenant colonel in the army, and he approached campaigning like a like a military campaign. Laid the maps out and did all the you know <laughs> we we had this area and this was we had to go attack these areas and go walk these areas and. The military so, approach the mil versus yeah. the, the business consulting right, right, approach. Right. And so uh, I learned an awful lot, again, from about grassroots campaigning from, from them. So I was really focusing more what was going on in Georgia, more so than, than at the national level. But during that time, um, I, Armstrong, Jim Armstrong called me one night and said, hey, I've got some tickets to a 
a Gingrich fundraiser, and uh, this would have been 80, probably 85. And I got, I've got tickets to a Gingrich fundraiser. My wife can't go. You want to go with me? I said, I said yeah, well, who's, who's going to be there? I said, he said, Jack Kemp. I said, the football player? I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I want to go. Because I watched Jack play when, you know, when I was a kid in the AFL on TV. And um, so uh, I went, not expecting, you know, I expect to see a football player, not a, not a politician. I knew he'd been a member, it was a, a member of Congress from Buffalo. And it was, I sat and listened to Jack Kemp, and it was like a religious experience. Totally transformed my uh, thinking and approach to politics. I was a conservative, and conservatives at that time were all against, I mean, it was, you, you ran against government. You hated government. Government was a necessary evil. And I had some cognitive dissonance over what, if, if, you know, why should I spend my life in, an, in, in a world where it, I'm, I'm, the best I can do is the lesser of evils? You right. know? And that, Jack was the first one who came along, even though Reagan was, was an optimist, Jack was the first who came along and talked to my generation about being conservative and using the government in a positive way. And I could now see that there was a way for me to be engaged politically from a positive perspective rather than always being against right. uh, everything. And uh, that was an enlightening experience for me. And so I started uh, whenever Jack, Jack was running around the country campaigning for Reagan. Whenever he was in Georgia, I tried to I'd be his driver, do whatever I could to build a relationship. And uh, so uh, over time, when he decided to run in 88, I, I wanted to be part of his team. This, it makes a lot more sense now than what you've said about the sort of the factions involved in 84 um, and, and 80, and then your experiences later, why you were on board with right. the Kemp campaign yep. in 88. Yep. So tell us about your experience in Georgia with the Kemp campaign. Uh, it was the first statewide campaign I had an opportunity to run. Um, Jack, uh, Jack and Newt were very, very close. Right. Uh, being in Congress, they were part of what, what I later learned when, when I went to Washington with Jack, were what they called the Five Amigos, which were, were Gingrich, uh, Connie Mack, uh, Kemp, Dick Army, and oh, the other one escapes me. But there were five of them. And they would meet regularly and talk about policy and, and what, how to transform the Reagan revolution into something more permanent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, when, um, and, and so Newt was the guy that Jack listened to about, about uh, who would uh, be uh, the leadership for his presidential campaign. And Jack actually preferred somebody else uh, to run the campaign. Uh, he liked him, he was an athlete, they had that kind of, uh, of uh, camaraderie. And Jack wasn't quite sure about me, he didn't know me that well. But uh, the other guy told Newt that, look, Newt, you cannot be part of this campaign, and uh, you're going to have to withdraw and just leave it to me, which, <laughs> you, you know, Newt, that was the exact wrong thing to say, and so that guy shot himself in the head, and I became the alternative. Uh, Newt said, well, Rusty's going to run the campaign in Georgia, and so I did. That's kind of how it, how it happened. Uh, you know, I've been I've been a place the, the just getting lucky breaks in politics is 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 important, uh, and that was one of them. Uh, so I ended up running running Jack's camp. I had to put the whole organization together from you know the North Georgia to South Georgia. I obviously utilized the Reagan organization. I've been part of that. Um, got some people, but not everybody. You know, uh, there were a lot of people who were big Bush supporters. Very, very hotly contested very primary contested, yeah. for, for for a sitting vice and president. And then we had uh, we had uh, uh, Dole was running, mm -hmm. and uh, also that's when uh, Reverend Robinson got in and brought all the evangelicals right. into the party. Right. That's when we had this huge influx of of uh, evangelicals. Very coming contentious, in. right? Very, and it was uh, <laughs> it was it was uh, you know like like most major transformations in politics. It was it was very difficult. And the 88 uh, convention in Albany is, is a perfect example of how messy it really got. Uh, but anyway, that was, um, you know, the, the, the big four really were Bush, uh, Robertson, Dole, and Kemp. And you had Pete DuPont and a couple others. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and uh, so I, I was putting the organization together and I worked very closely with a guy in Alabama, Paul Houghton, who was the chair chairman over there, and Henry McMaster. Uh, was Kemp's chairman in in uh, in '88, who's today the governor of South Carolina. He was that's right. He lieutenant, lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor. So uh, uh, that that Kemp organization, uh, you know, we we stuck around for a while, and and Henry was Jack's campaign uh, chairman in South Carolina. I was in Georgia, and then later Henry, our paths had paralleled because he he became the chairman of the state of, of the uh, South Carolina party when I was chairman of the state Republican party. But anyway, the 88 campaign, I, uh, that gave me my shot uh, to, um, to uh, really run a statewide campaign, be part of a presidential campaign. And so we did. And Jack really just never got off the ground. And there was a number of reasons for that. One, uh, he, he was really the, the, the intellectual force behind what we knew as Reaganomics, I mm -hmm. mean, the tax cuts. He and Art Lathifer had persuaded President Reagan to, uh, or then Governor Reagan, to run on the what was called the Kemp-Roth tax cut. And so that became Reaganomics, and that was Jack's baby. That's what he talked about. And so when he ran in 88, by 88, that was Republican orthodoxy. Every right. Republican candidate could run on tax cuts and, and minimizing the size of government by reducing the revenue rather than raising taxes constantly to, to match the spending. Uh, and so he had no unique platform at that point. Mm -hmm. So he went kind of off into uh, a victim of his own success. He was a victim of his own success. He should have kept kept it to himself. I'm not sure <laughs> Reagan would. Uh, no, it was good. Reagan <laughs> Reagan was a great president, and, and the country's much better off because of it. But it sure hampered his ability to run. Uh, he was, you know, spent a lot of time talking about gold standard and a lot of things that people never understood. And as a result, never really got any traction. When uh, they had the South Carolina primary on the Saturday before uh, the Georgia primary, uh, Jack didn't run well. In fact, uh, we had a the Library of Congress did a deal with all of us, and and uh, Charlie Black, who was the campaign strategist, uh, I, I told this story, and he he later came back and told me on tape why he had done this. Um, I got a phone call Saturday night from Jack in South Carolina saying, I'm getting a lot of pressure to drop out. What, you, what are you thinking? I said, well, Jack, we're four days, three days from Georgia dropping This is out. Super Tuesday. This is Super yeah. Tuesday in, in 88. I said, we're three days away. We've worked our butts off in this campaign. Let's see what we would have gotten. And uh, he said, okay, all right, I'll stay and we'll see what we do on Tuesday in Super Tuesday. Uh, and what was happening was Charlie Black was was pushing Jack to get out because he was talking to the Reagan camp uh, to the Bush campaign, trying to get Jack uh, a seat on that train before it totally <laughs> left the station. And that's what Charlie told me later. That was the b behind the scenes politics. I said, "Well, Charlie, if you'd explain that to me, I might have had a different opinion." But be that as it may, it all worked out, mm -hmm. and we came in fourth, I think, uh, or third, fourth. Uh, behind Dole, Bush, and, and, and Robertson, and then yeah. Jack dropped out. And, uh, but it was a great experience for me. I built relationships that still today in the Republican Party uh, exist, and I learned an awful lot. Nuts and bolts question. Okay. How, how is running statewide campaign different than, than the campaigns you had running? Every step on the political ladder is not a single step. It's, it's an incremental step. Okay. When okay. you're running for city council, it's very retail politics. But then you run statewide. It's not just one step up. You you know if you're like it's sort of an exponential. It is level an exponential group. step, and and that's what it is. When you run, it's kind of like when you run for the legislature, mm -hmm. say for the house, that's a step. And then running for the senate is an, an, an incremental step. And then running statewide is an even bigger incremental step. And then running for president is the biggest incremental step of all. So you just think that there's a little stairway or a ladder that you go up. You really have to leap to go to the next level. It's not just a step. It's a, it's a leap. And the rules change. The scrutiny changes. Uh, the amount of pressure that's on you to make the right decisions, the coalitions, everything gets to be much more complex uh, as you go up the scale. And so I learned uh, during that process what that incremental process was 
and how big a leap it is. So it was a, it was a huge education for me to understand that, that, at least change my perspective. As I say, by this time I'd completed my master's work on campaigns and elections. That was not something that they taught at Georgia, <laughs> Georgia State when I was going through no. the class. Those were things you have to learn in the streets. And, uh, and, and it was a great opportunity for me to learn that. But it, but it also got me connected so that when Jack went to HUD, it gave me an opportunity to go there. So y you do go to Washington, mm -hmm. um, finally. Yeah. After after a few yeah. few year delay, you, you end up in Washington. How involved were you, or or uh, did you keep tabs on, on politics back home while you were I while did. you were up there? I did. I never changed my voting. I had Falcon season tickets. I didn't give those up. I kept my <laughs> connection back to Georgia uh, intact. Uh, uh, but but you're still six hundred miles away. You don't you're not you're not in the day to day milieu of of politics. So, um, uh, but I kept, I, I, you know, under federal rules, I was able to get one local newspaper. Uh, <laughs> so I had the, uh, what a rule. The, the Constitution. I got that every day. So I was keeping up with what was going on. I was talking to people, but not, again, not in the day-to-day -day, uh, mix of what was going in the, on in the state. And there were a lot of things happening at the state level, local level, uh, that I missed out on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I enjoyed the, the, the four years working for Jack was a great great experience. He had had some great coaches that taught him some great management skills that he applied. Uh, he was a tough boss, demanding boss. Uh, uh, wanted you to do things right. Uh, I'll never forget. I went into for a presentation one time, and Jack could within three questions figure out what you had not thought about. And, and then when he found that, when he found that hole in your armor, he just, <laughs> one day I went in and he gave me the, the 20 questions. I had answers for everything. And it was, it, it was frustrating for him. <laughs> but it was a proud moment for me. He said, well, I guess we thought about everything today, haven't we, Mr. Paul? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Secretary, we have. <laughs> but it was a good experience. Sure. You know, it was a great experience. Sounds like my major professor. Uh, you know, you need that. You need that. You need that critical thinking you need to hone your, your intellectual capabilities against that kind of, of demand so that you, you get better. So it was a great experience for me. So you, if, staying up in, in Washington from 89 to 93, yep. mm -hmm. um, so you missed out on, on, on Johnny Isaacson's gubernatorial right. campaign, right. Paul Coverdell's right. successful right. Senate campaign. Right. Well, I got here just at the end. Coverdale, okay. Okay. Coverdale so was in the runoff. Yeah. Okay. I got here for the end of that, so and Jack came fall. down, we did... We did some campaigning after that, you know, because that that spilled on in uh, to uh, and this I think was the, January. The the Bob Barr. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, are, are we talking general election? Runoff? Yeah, we're talking the general election okay. and okay. then the runoff that that he was in uh, with Watch Fowler. Mm -hmm. So I was back in the state for that. Jack came down and did some campaigning. Anytime Jack came to the South, uh, I uh, I still did advance work for him sure. uh, and, and others. So I got back here just at the tail end of, of Coverdale. Uh, Coverdale's wing and my wing of the party were never, we, we didn't get along very well. We were part of those early factions that just did, there was a lot of distrust. And it, it carried on even sure. into in when the Republicans became very successful. But we were able always to come to some accommodation, you know, in, in the end. Well, that, that that's, sort of leads me into my next question of, of you had, you had mentioned the Coverdell faction. The Coverdell faction, has sent, if, if, you, if we're talking the chairmanship of the party, mm -hmm. had been in control of the party since they ousted one of your, your mentors, Matt Patton, yeah. back in 1981. Right. Had a series of uh, right. Matt, uh, uh, Fred Cooper, Bob Bell, Paul Coverdell himself, John Stuckey, Alec Poitivant. Yeah. Uh, that, that, they had controlled. They had definitely controlled the party all the way up until I got elected. And then we have Rusty Paul. Yeah. How and, does that happen? Uh, well, it's Why does that happen? Why does that happen? <laughs> well, let me go back and give you a little bit of perspective. Right. I've been out of state for four years. Right. And uh, I had been in '84 and in '88. Uh, in, in '88, particularly with the Kemp campaign, we were always trying to cut deals with the Robertson campaign. They had done it up in, in Michigan, Dick Postumus, uh, who was running Kemp's campaign, and two of his operatives, Andy and Saul Anuzas, right, right, yeah. who uh, still around uh, and good friends of mine, um, 
they they cut a deal with the Robertson organization in Michigan, and the Kemp organization tried to replicate that around the rest of, uh, and you know, they knew that they were mutually you know, only one of them could make it. They were fighting for the same voter base. And we spent a lot of time trying to work out deals with the Robertson campaign in Georgia in the 88 campaign. It, it just wouldn't work. Brant Frost, good guy, still around. Uh, we ran against each other for chairman. He was the Robertson campaign manager at the time and just didn't, compromise is not a word that he is comfortable with. That's something that you and, and, the, and the Bush team, I think, would agree on right. from that period. It was, and, and, and that was one of the reasons why in the end we kind of went you know, I mean, uh, with the, with Bushes, I think Jack was a little bit more, I, I think, philosophically and, and culturally probably more comfortable with the Bushes. They, mm -hmm. they had a lot of disagreements, but uh, but be that as it may, we tried to hammer these things out. We never could do it, but I built a lot of relationships right. with, uh, with the evangelical community in the state. So when I came back in, uh, in 90, uh, at the end, in January of 93, I started my, a business um, didn't didn't really give a lot of thought to uh, getting involved in politics yet. I knew I would at some point, but I was getting reestablished in Georgia. Uh, had moved to Sandy Springs. My back my base had been opened to Cab. The Cab had changed dramatically since I had left, and so I was in North Fulton County. The uh, I got a phone call one day from a guy by the name of Phil Neff. Phil, I had gotten to know during he was a Robertson guy in in '88. And we had had conversations. He was a little bit more flexible than, than Brant was, and so we had some conversations. I got a phone call. He said, uh, Rusty, uh, I'm talking to some of the folks in the carpet industry, and we think that you would make a great state party chairman. Have you given any thought to running? And I hadn't. And I told him, uh, I said, no, Phil, I that, that's the, I'm, I'm out of state. Nobody knows who I am. I've been gone four years. Nobody knows who I am. And he laid out all the reasons why he thought I should. And he asked me to come up to Dalton to sit down with some folks in the carpet industry uh, to talk about it. So I did. I went up. I listened. We talked. I said, let me go think about it. I went home, called him back, said no. And he called me again and said, come back up here. We still want to talk to you. <laughs> and I said no a second time. And then the third time I went up. He was persistent. And I went up and I said no the third time. And then I was driving back down I-75, and just about the time I got to Marietta, I got to thinking, you know, you've been gone for four years. You're not going to win this thing, but it would be a real good opportunity to get back and get engaged in the party. Might help your business. You'll get some name ID out. I have a little bit of press coverage. So uh, I called him. Uh, we, that was the early days of the cell phone era. <laughs> called him from my cell phone and said, Phil, I've given it some thought. I'm going to run. I was the last candidate in. I'm in the last candidate in by months, a right. couple, three months. And given it, but but I, the one thing I had learned, I mean, I had I had my degree. I, I never finished my thesis, so I didn't have the degree. I moved to Washington before I got the thesis done, but I had my classwork done. And I thought, you know, I know what the party ought to be doing, and it's really not. You know, the party is about electing people to office, philosophy, uh, you know, policy. That's the that's the uh, area of, of the elected officials, the party's got to be focused on electing people. And I didn't think we did a very good job at that. And I sat down and wrote out a, what I called my manifesto and outlined what I thought the party ought to be doing to elect people to office. And it was things like, uh, I had just finished at Georgia State, uh, where, and Mike Benford was the uh, mm -hmm. professor there in camp, doing the campaign to manage. I said, oh, you know, I want to send some more kids into this. because. When the Capitol in, emptied, when I, my classmates were all Democrats who worked at the Capitol coming down to get their degree, I said, well, we ought to have our own force. So I said, we, I'll, I'll, I'm going to provide scholarships to teach young Republicans how to run campaigns. The, the criticism of the Republican Party was we picked pin, winners and losers. Uh, the party decided who got funded and who didn't. I said, we're going to make it, the campaign's going to decide. Here, they, we're going to give them a list of 10 things. If they do these 10 things, and it was all things that were designed, you know, you have a mentor from the legislator, you got to go out and raise so much money, you got to knock on so many doors each week. You, it was a checklist of 10 things that they would have to do, and then we would give them money mm -hmm. if they did that. It was automatic. There was no, no decision-making process. Uh, they decided. 
And there was a list of those things. And I went around the state talking about those things that I thought we, the party ought to be doing. And uh, it just began to quietly, people began to buy into it. I knew, I mean, I didn't have any money for polling or anything else. Everybody else said, you had Don Balfour, Mike Sullivan, Brant Frost, me. Uh, and uh, they had very sophisticated operations. I just go around telling everybody what I thought and being just very candid. Then all of a sudden I started hearing my opponents talk about some of the things I was talking about. So hmm, this is beginning to get a little traction. And we were going into one debate somewhere and Brant, pulled me aside and said, you're beginning to move up in our polling. You're, you're beginning to get some traction out there. And I had no clue. Uh, and so um, uh, I just kept talking about this. And uh, when we got to the state convention, I, 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 you, you don't really realize when the floor votes are going on. We had a good floor operation, and that really helped make a, 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 a big difference. But in the end, just going out and telling what I thought the party could do, what we could do with the party, focusing on electing, training people. I, we had what we called the Republican advance. I stole it. I'm a great stealer of ideas. I stole this one from Virginia. They had what they called the advance. They didn't retreat. They advanced. And so we had the Republican advance where we trained grassroots Republicans in grassroots politics. Right. It wasn't just coming together and fighting over offices. We wanted to, to increase the intellectual capital about campaigns and, and, and so on within the party. So we did a lot of that sort of stuff, and I talked about how we would do it, and on the fifth, fourth or fifth ballot, I won. I thought I'd lost. I would miscounted in my head <laughs> the, the votes uh, from the fourth district, which was Mike Sullivan's district, and I had won that. That was my old district, That's but I didn't old, live yep. there anymore. And I had won that one, and I I'd left that out of my calculations, and I thought I'd lost. And when they announced that I'd won, I was really surprised. I told my, I'd already told my wife, oh, Aunt Jan, I think we just lost. And then when they uh, they announced that I'd won, I was kind of surprised. I had no idea what I was going to say when I got up there, and still don't even remember what I said. But uh, we went out and began to execute the plan. I started getting young uh, men and women uh, who were young Republicans in. And we didn't send them to Georgia State, but we, I did send them to the various Republican training schools, and a lot of them are still around. There were people like Chip Lake, nice. um, uh, Brett, uh, McElhannon, uh, Josh Kivett, who went out to Oklahoma still. They're still managing campaigns today, you know, 25 years later. So there's a great legacy there. And we assigned these people to manage campaigns. In other words, here are 10 legislative races. Right. And... Um, and so they, you're assigned these 10 races, and they ran those races. Even John Watson. John was our finance director, and I assigned him a certain number of campaigns to run, too. Uh, and and this, we, is, this is the current, the incumbent yeah, the current, party the current chairman. current party chairman. Yeah. So, you know, he's, he was one of mine. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> he says that's with a, a smile. Yeah, great. So uh, we did those things. We, we, we did it, and we had a real impact. And we really invested in technology. Mm -hmm. We had very poor technology when I got there. We only had 4,000 contributors. Uh, and if you had ever attended a Republican convention and written a check for your, your convention fees, you were a contributor. So it really was, there was really no real base of, of Republican um, donors in the state. And so Coverdale, the Coverdale folks were not happy that I got elected. And Who had they, I say they? They had supported Balfour, Don, Don Balfour, Balfour, in the main. And uh, so uh, uh, they, were, they were sort of in a panic that day because uh, they thought I would shut everybody out. But my goal was not to shut anybody out. My goal was really to bring the party together. I was just, forget about everything that's gone on. We've got a real opportunity. This state is going to become Republican. It'll become Republican faster if we all get together and do the right things. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I tried to do. I emulated Matt Patton a little bit and what he taught me about bringing those, your opponents to you right. rather than keeping them pushed aside. <clears throat> so, um, so we did that. And we, in over four years, we went from 4,000 contributors to over 45,000. Uh, we put together a real solid direct mail fundraising. That's when direct mail fundraising was at its height. Right. Uh, I, I wanted to get the best people that I could. Um, I told uh, everybody that we were like a football team that had gone 0 for 125. Yeah. 
uh, and uh, bringing in people from the that had been part of the previous O for 125 didn't make sense. So I went to Virginia and hired uh, Brian Slater to be the executive director. They had a very up and coming party there. I hired John to be the finance director because he'd done that for um, for uh, Bob Barr and mm -hmm. uh, his cousin had worked for me at HUD, and when John came down here, I, that's how we, I got him involved. So I got him with, with uh, Barr, so I called Barr back and said, all right, I gave him to you for two years, I want him back. Bob Barr, who had just won a just seat. Just won a congressional Congress. seat. Right. And so um, all those things, I, I, I tried to put together the best possible team, bring people from the outside, then take these young Republicans who had not been tainted by the old ways of doing things sure. and, re and train them in how you manage campaigns and do it successfully. And we, we, we started, that was um, uh, really in, 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 in 95, that's really when all the pieces started falling in place. Uh, we used technology, we were able, I was out raising money. Coverdale tried, to, the Coverdale folks tried to cut my money off. And the, but when I looked at the fundraising list, I knew who their folks were and I said, you know, there's a whole group of people out there who never give money to the Republican Party. So I didn't even bother with that group. I went around and developed a whole new, whole new base of, of, of contributors that they had no control over. And uh, uh, I started meeting with the, the lobbyists and the government affairs and the corporate folks and I was selling insurance. So the day's coming. You know, I know you got to give to the Democrats, and you can't really go out and give to the Republican candidates because Tom Murphy and Zell Miller and all those guys <laughs> will come down on your head. But I said, you give it to me. You give it to the state party. I'll use it in the right way, and when the day comes, I'll make sure that everybody knows that you got credit. So I'm out selling insurance. That's how I raised the money that we, we, we use to, to, uh, to fund the operation and do the things. Then I met every Friday with the House and Senate leadership to plot strategy and talk about, you know, recruit candidates, figure out who, you know, the training programs, uh, what we could do legislatively. And this is, this is Bob Irvin in the Bob House. Bob Irvin's in the House and started with uh, Chuck Clay and, right, and right. then uh, Skin Edge right. in, in the Senate and with their, their, chief, uh, uh, their chief leadership. I had a, a, a great guy uh, uh, who was a former basketball coach at, at Oglethorpe who was the recruiter and uh, he, uh, he would call me and say I need you to call this person and this is what I want you to tell him and that's why I do exactly exactly what he said <laughs> and we recruited a lot of great candidates we were beginning to get candidates who were more mainstream you want to get the folks who remembered the Rotary the Chamber of Commerce and we were finally able to start getting those because we could finally offer them a vision about how they could win. And we could promise them real, uh, real tangible assets to win. I give you a campaign manager for free. We'll print all your materials because we gang, we'll design and print, we gang printed everything. I mean, we cut the, the cost of, of scale. Yeah, we cut the cost of a campaign by 50%. Uh, that means a lot when you run a huge, state house race. Well, you could run like a state. Well, you could run a state house race for twenty-five grand at the time, and a senate race for fifty. So if you cut it to twelve, right. and still be competitive, you've done a, a heck of a job. And, right. and and we could we give a list of things. Here's what we'll do: we'll print all your stuff. We'll give you a campaign manager for free. Uh, we'll give you a legislative mentor to talk to and help you understand what the issues are. We did all that stuff, and everything started falling into place. And I hired a guy from Iowa to be our IT guy. And he, uh, Mike wrote all of the code and we, we, we basically had a, 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 our own technology software for campaign management and we utilized that. Uh, and uh, so we had tools now that we could give candidates. Compared to the Democrats, where, where Georgia Democrats, where were you IT-wise, technology-wise, organizationally? They, they had ossified. Their right. whole structure at that point was ossified. Okay. They had no real ability. They had a few people like Bobby Kahn who were running campaigns, but they really had no party structure. Get, yeah, infrastructure. They, they had the no, and and for, yeah. neither had the Republicans up to this point. We put it all together. Uh, it was me and Brian Slater and 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 uh, John Watson who come he come from Virginia too. And then when Brian left to run uh, the Gilmore gubernatorial race in Virginia, I brought uh, 
uh, Jim King from, from the Pennsylvania party down. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, when John went off to run Bowers' campaign, I brought uh, the finance director from the state of Illinois down. So we, we brought really top-notch people in here who knew how to do this stuff and do it right so we could put the infrastructure together. So we were, we were doing stuff. And then there was state law, and I'll make another confession here. <laughs> State law says that you can spend unlimited amounts on your ticket. And the way the parties had manipulated that in the past is they would do a, a, a mail piece with the primary candidate on there, and then they'd list three or four or five other candidates on, on the piece, which took up space and diluted the message. And I said, I asked the lawyers, I said, what, where in this code does it define a ticket? And they said, well, it really doesn't define a ticket. <laughs> I said, then what is the penalty for violating this law? I said, well, there's really no penalty. So I said, there's no definition for a ticket, and nobody goes to jail if we violate this one, right? <laughs> and they said, well, yeah. I said, okay, I'm defining the ticket for the Republican Party to be any candidate who's running for the Georgia General Assembly or statewide office. I'm not, it's not county commission, it's not city council. It's not district attorney. If you're running for the uh, state office, mm -hmm. then you're part of our ticket. So we could spend, I, just, I declared we could spend unlimited amounts on those candidates. So we broke through all of the, the spending limitations that ostensibly were in place because there was no clear definition of what a ticket was. So I felt reasonably comfortable that we could get by with that part. And we did. So now we're spending, instead of, Two, you know, a thousand dollars was the max. We were up to that point. The Republican Party was just simply another contributor. Now we could be a real player. Okay. We could okay. put serious money into targeted races, and uh, and make a difference. And we did. And I kept waiting for the Democrats to catch up and say, you know, how are they doing all this? And start raising holy hell about it. And they never said a peep for four years. We got by with it, and nobody ever raised the issue. So that, you know, and Steve Anthony was the executive director of the state party. Steve and I run around the state debating each other, and he never even asked me about it. I said, what are you guys doing? How are you getting by with that? And we were able to pull out. I mean, I could put six, $7,000 into, into a house race, uh, and now we're real players. Right. This, my second term is, is party chairman. We did that the first time. The second time, we had candidates coming to us and say, here's my campaign treasury. Take it. They gave <laughs> us their money. We matched it. We ran their campaigns and, and used it, the, and they raised money for us to go out and do this stuff. And then we used the campaign laws very effectively. We had, and those were the days of hard money and soft money. And hard money in Georgia, we could use soft money. We could use corporate, corporate money. Still can. And nationally, hard dollars were at a premium. And so when we would get more hard dollars than we could utilize, I called Tommy Hopper, who was my regional political director, and said, Tommy, I got $100,000 in hard money. See what you can get, get for it. <laughs> and we'd go out and we'd hold an auction. And he'd call the, the RNC, the senatorial committee, or the congressional committee and say, I got, Georgia's got $100,000 in, um, <clears throat> in hard dollars. How much soft dollars will you give them? <laughs> we'd get a 25 to 50 percent premium. We'd get give them 100,000. We'd get 125, 150,000 back because they couldn't spend the soft money, right. the corporate money. So we were doing those kind of things to to supplement what we were doing legislatively. Hmm. So we were leveraging our funds uh, in that way to be able to augment what we were able to raise. So we we were very creative in how we uh, uh, attacked the problems of, uh, so it was a very close working rela relationship mm -hmm. with the legislative leadership and they were doing things on the floor. We'd, we'd plot strategy about legislatively, how to keep th throwing grease or, or sand into the gears of the democratic machine and, and, and how we could, we could drive wedges between rural Democrats and urban uh, Democrats. Uh, and, and we did a pretty good job to the point that by the time I was chairman in my second term, we had a lot of rural Democrats switching parties. That's when Mike Bauer switched parties. Right. Uh, Sonny Perdue switched. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a huge number of, of rural Democrats who, were, who just couldn't vote with the majority anymore. Uh, and so that's when things really began to shake. We had uh, Nathan Deal switched. Uh, 
1995. Uh, uh, all, all that was while I was still party chairman. We had about a, a dozen or so legislators. Now, not all of them won the next election. Sure. But it started that trend. We even had one or two kind of liberal, uh, left of center Republicans like Kathy Ash left because she felt the party drifting too far away from her on the right hand side. So there was a complete realignment of the, of the party at that time. And then we had, by that point, we had also come to, we reconciled uh, ourselves with the evangelicals. I didn't even have to ask you the question. And now they were an important part of our of the coalition, mm -hmm. which was really the group that pushed us over the top in the end. Getting those those rural they were largely rural, but there were a lot of urban suburban voters too. Sure. That gave us the opportunity to win in districts that we never we now had a coalition that gave us a real shot at a majority. When you were targeting races, mm -hmm. you, you began as chairman in '95. Were you still targeting, by and large, those suburban, sort of northern arc, uh, uh, north, older no. suburbs, or no. were were no. you trying to expand we beyond that old? No, we, 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 you you can't survive there. Right, you can't survive there. You got to build a larger coalition if you're going to be a statewide party. You got to be able to compete at, 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 at every level. And the truth is, it was cheaper to run rural races than it was. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Was, uh, we could make our money uh, go a lot further when we were working uh, in some of these rural districts. Uh, so, uh, no, we were, we, were, we were at that point focused on building a true statewide network and operation. Not necessarily organizing in every county. Right, because that's that's been the goal. That was the goal. Oh, no, we want we want, yeah. we want to no no. That's <laughs> diluting your effort. Focus your effort where you got real opportunities, and that's what we tried to do. We tried to be um, smart about the candidates and the races. Again, we didn't decide who was the good, best candidate. Who was we let their performance in the field determine whether they were a candidate that needed support or not. If they were doing the things that were necessary to win, we supported them. If they weren't. We, I, I had no problems cutting the rope, letting them drift. Uh, it, was, it was that kind of pragmatic approach to winning elections mm -hmm. uh, because we could sense it. We, we, we could get up every day, and the leadership in the House and the Senate could feel it coming. Every election we were picking up 5, 10, 15 legislative seats, and so you could see it was inevitable. Uh, we, just had to, we just had to keep pushing at what I saw as the rotten core of the Democratic structure and coalition in the state to, to make it fall apart. And ultimately, not while I was chairman, but within two years afterward, it, it occurred. Why did it take so long for the, for the Democratic coalition <coughs> to crack? Well, first of all, people form their political identities early. It's like I was in my teens and early 20s when I became a Republican. And you keep that throughout your whole life. I mean, while I've got real issues with my party today, I'm not leaving. You know, it's too late for me to go somewhere else. Uh, I'll fight to try and make my, my, uh, my ideas heard. But you, you don't change that identity. So it's truly a generation-long process. You have to get people when they're younger to be, buy into what your vision is for the state or the country or the city or whatever it is. And they form that identification and they hold it. So it created, we created an, an enormous amount of cognitive dissonance for conservative Democrats till finally, in the end, we, it, it broke. But it was more of a generational process than it was. I wasn't going to get an 80-year-old person who'd been voting Democrat since their father had come back from the Civil War <laughs> to vote Republican. But I could get their grandson. Mm -hmm. I could get their granddaughter. And that's where we focused, to get those people who had conservative values uh, and, but, but again, couldn't quite, like I did, couldn't quite buy into George Wallace and, and Bull Connor. Right. They needed to look at Tom Murphy and Zell Miller and those, that era of Democratic politician. They couldn't identify with them. They were our best assets uh, because we could go out and say, you know, Tom Murphy, he's the longest serve. He, you know, there's no upward mobility. Look at, you got, you got Zell Miller and, and, and Tom Murphy have held the top two jobs in, in Georgia Democratic Party for a quarter of a century. Since what opportunity are you going to have? Okay. If you really want to move up and move, and I could tell my story about how fast I moved up in the Republican Party. And so I could offer, that, well, not just me, but others could offer a, a, a vision about what we could do, how we could change things for the better. 
uh, create a new kind of Georgia uh, that focused on, on policy rather than protecting the power structure. Did, did Sonny Perdue and Saxby Chambliss, you know, a middle Georgia guy, a south Georgia guy, make, make it easier for, for, for you to crack those and conservative And Nathan Deal. Right. Don't leave him out. Sure. I mean, those, those rural... Uh, and nor uh, North, North Georgia. Georgia. Right. Nathan's from Gainesville. Right. No, those, those were indispensable to this process. But it, was, it, was a, it wasn't my persuasiveness that got those <laughs> folks across or anybody else's persuasiveness. It was an understanding that Georgia politics was changing, that the, uh, the coalitions that were holding the Democratic Party together at that point no longer had the glue. The only thing that held them together was not principle, not philosophy. It was about protecting access to power. And that can only carry you so far. If you don't have ideas that, that motivate people, that get them excited about it. It was like me when I ran into Jack Kemp. Now I'm excited. There's a reason for me to invest my life in this. If you don't give people a reason to get excited and be invested in the process, they got other things they can do. So uh, uh, th those folks who had been part of the structure was not, were un very uncomfortable with where the Democratic Party was going, uh, were, were, were the, the avalanche that really kind of brought it all, all down, brought it all down. You know, you mentioned you know early on about you know, the party sort of just switching labels. Um, how how is the the Republican Party as a governing party differed from from the, that Democratic coalition that you were talking about? Tragically, not much. That's been my biggest disappointment. Expand on that a little bit. I really, I mean, I'm an idealist. Even I'm 65 years old today. This is my 40th year, and I was elected. City Council, December 7th, 1977, another day that will live in infamy. <laughs> uh, so this is my 40th year. I've spent my life as an idealist, and I'm, 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 I'm a little crusty, but I still at heart am a believer in, in the good side of politics. And I love the people that are our leaders, people like David Rawson, been a friend of mine for 30 years, great people. Uh, the leadership of the House, the leadership of the Senate that I served with. Tragically, what I've learned over 40 years is, is you, you can't change human nature. And politics is the most, in my, in my experience now, is probably the most revealing laboratory of the, to study the the nature of the human beast or the human being that exists in society today. When I tell people they get upset with Congress or whatever, I say, look, Congress is nothing more than the United States looking at itself in the mirror. They are a reflection of who we are. They are not who we are. They reflect who we are. Uh, we elect them, and we elect them because what they've told us. And it, the, 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 the fracture in, the, in, 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 in national politics today is not driven by the politicians, it's driven by the people. They are the ones who have these attitudes. They, the, the members of Congress, senators, or the legislature, they honestly do, because they want to get reelected, they're trying to figure out what, the, what everybody back home wants them to right. do. And so they go up there and they try to do that. So it's, it's really a reflection of the country, uh, the elected bodies that we have. And uh, so that's been the real disappointment. My idealistic um, visions when I started out and still hold today, I still think that politics can be a noble calling, that it can be something that somebody, a young person, can invest their lives in. Uh, but I am disappointed because it comes down to human nature. And, and as a result, the politics reflects who we are as people. And Georgia has not changed much over those 40 years, not the basic core of who Georgians are. Mm -hmm. And so the politics at the Capitol reflect that. And that was something that I didn't understand when I started on the journey, that I understand now looking through the rearview mirror that, uh, that my expectations were unrealistic. But that doesn't mean that even within the fact that politics haven't changed, that it's the, a true reflection of, 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 of the human nature, still doesn't mean that you can't get positive things done. I was just a little bit more idealistic, and I, I support a lot of what the 
the leadership does. I don't agree with them on everything. I grew up in rural Georgia, I mean rural Alabama. I had my first gun when I was 12. When I was 14, I was out rabbit hunting with a bunch mm -hmm. of other 14 year old kids. And my parents and grandparents never thought anything about it. It was normal. If my 25 year old came in and grabbed his gun, went out the back door, I'd be right on top of him. What's going, what's going on, what's happening? <laughs> uh, so society has changed. Right. Human nature hasn't changed at all. And so our politics is a reflection of that. So the idealistic things that I'd aspired to see happen haven't come totally to fruition. I think that the Republicans are making more of the better kind of decisions I feel comfortable What sort of policy, what were your policy expectations? You, oh, I was, spent a, all this I was, time I was a low tax, I mean, obviously being a Kempite. Uh, right, you know, sure. You, you, low tax, uh, but also socially aware, uh, you know, uh, tried to bridge. Growing up in, in a poor part of, of Alabama, um, I felt, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a quintessential American success story. I'm a Horatio Alger story. I'm, I'm the only kid in my 27 graduating class that went straight to college and graduated in four years. Wow. Others went back and oh, so sure, on. But, sure. but, but, you know, uh, my teachers were, were, were educating farmers and truck drivers and mechanics. I somehow got through and, <laughs> and took a different path. And, but th I'm no smarter than anybody else. I'm not any more moral or, or I'm, I'm a kid who grew up in rural Alabama, moved to Georgia, found success by doing, finding out at an early age my passion and being able to do it. I told my kids at Christmas, who gets at the age of 21, 22 years old decides what they want to do, and then over the next 45 years, go out and get to do it all. Get to do it all. That's a great success story, and, 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 and politics has allowed me to do that. Uh, and it's mostly, and, and, and despite as tough a business as it can be, uh, it's been very rewarding for me. Uh, but again, I've learned an awful lot over that time, and, and uh, it's, Mick Jagger had it right. You can't always get what you want. But you get what you, you need. get what you need. That's right. Well, speaking of what we need, we, we spoke briefly before we turned the camera on about transportation. Right. And, and oh, I was going to ask you, what are some policy fronts that, that Democrats and Republicans can actually work on together in this hyper-partisan? Is transportation one, or is it yeah. still the rural-urban no, divide? No, no, no. It's have? changing. It's changing. That, that's the good thing. That's where my optimism and idealism is coming together. Um, I've always been pretty pragmatic about you know, being focused on, on problem solving, mm -hmm. uh, philosophy. As we, as we talked earlier, Pothole has no philosophy. It has no partisanship. It's not North or South or East or West or Republican or Democrat, Black or White, Hispanic, Asian. Uh, it's a pothole. And you got to go fill it. Right. So that's, that's by, by being focused on that. And, and, and I'm seeing glimmers of hope where that is changing. We've done that in Fulton County. Over the, in Fulton County, the commission there has been dysfunctional as long as I've been here. <laughs> it was divided racially, it was divided geographically, it was divided by partisanship, and it was just divided over foolishness. And, and, and in the last couple of years, changes there have allowed us to come together, north and south. I mean, Fulton is probably the most diverse county in the state. It's the longest, 70 miles from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. So we were able to come together uh, north-south, urban, suburban, black, white, Republican, Democrat, and really sit down in, around a table with mayors mm -hmm. and county commissioners who are very problem-oriented uh, and start putting all those, what I call irrelevant factors aside and focus on the problem. And we were, we were able to get a, a T plus that, that allows us to start working. We didn't do anything in, in transportation in Georgia. And it's largely a, a result of the shift. The Democrats didn't want to take on big initiatives gotcha. because they didn't want to upset people with taxes. Republicans were unsure first coming in. They had to learn the ropes. So we went through about a 20-year period where some very serious problems in the state were neglected and because of... of the Democrats and Republicans, that shift that was going on. So it's, it, Churchill referred to the period between World War I and World War II as the years of the locust state. In Georgia, when it comes to transportation, the period from the, the early 90s until uh, HB 170 passed a couple of years ago were the years that the locust ate when it came to transportation planning. We went from the metropolitan Atlanta area 
went from an area, uh, a population of about one and a half, two million people up to five million mm -hmm. people, going now to eight million people. And we have not accommodated uh, the transportation. We have, we have practical problems. I mean, most cities are built on the grid and, you know, First <laughs> Avenue, Third Avenue, and it's on, and you just, you know, you just keep moving over because you find a way that is cleared. Because of the topography of the metropolitan Atlanta area, on a mountaintop, hills and valleys, on a river, you can't do that. It's not cost effective. So you have to go around the hills. <laughs> and so the connectivity, I mean, in, in North Fulton, if you took a map of 1940s North Fulton, You've only, you would see that there have only been two new arterial roads that have been built since the 1940s. Now we've widened some and we've built a lot of new subdivision roads, but arterials, the only two arterial roads have been built in North Fulton, and this is not just something that's there, it, it's all over the region, were Georgia 400 and 285. Right. Every other road that we utilize that we're now, we try to move thousands of people a day, were old farm roads that were adapted that did follow the topography because they were easy to build. And we've adapted those old farm roads to try, try to move millions of people, and it doesn't work. So, um, and, and there was no thinking or planning done, which exacerbated a practical set of problems. So now we're trying to catch up. And uh, I was probably one of the first mayors, Republicans, to come out. In fact, one of the reporters that, at the Constitution said that they were in shock in the newsroom when I first came out and said, we need to expand MARTA. A Republican talking positively about MARTA? Well, you're not going to be able to move 8 million people in one person per vehicle increments. No. you got to rethink how you move people. And again, we, you get, get, get problem-solving oriented people in a room and we, we'll, we'll, we'll hammer it out. Uh, the teeth floss was amazingly quickly done with all the diversity in that room. Uh, we came to conclusions fairly quickly and then it was just a matter of getting the details done. I'm hoping we'll do that on transit. The governor deal has been a great leader on this. First governor uh, since I've been here who really took that on. Mm -hmm. That's not criticism of, of Sonny or anybody else. They, they were in a different period. As I say, they were, they were consolidating power. They couldn't really take on the big things. Nathan has been able to do that and bring people together and then give those of us at the local level an opportunity to dig into some of these problems. And hopefully, um, you know, we can't get those 20, 25, 30 years that we lost, but we can now take advantage of the evolving technologies in transportation to, to figure out what a 21st century transportation network really will look like. So when we're doing our planning now, and this is not history, this is future. Yeah. But as we're doing our planning now, I'm telling everybody, don't worry about whether it's, it's heavy rail, light rail, bus, whatever. Figure out where people need to go, and then we'll adapt these evolving technologies to, to make it work. Mm -hmm. Don't lock in on a technology. I, this shows my age. I said, I, we don't want to choose beta when VHS is the, uh, oh, wow. the technology of the future. That, says, that shows how long, how far back I go technology. Uh, you know, you, 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 don't want to, you don't want to guess wrong on the technology. Right. It's going to cost too much, right. you know, and you can't afford failure. So let's see how it's going to evolve, and then we'll figure it out. So those are the kind of things that we're grappling with now uh, at the local level where this hyper-partisanship doesn't really exist today. Mm -hmm. uh, just an understanding that we got, we got people beating on our heads because they can't move, and so we're going to go out and try and figure out how we can, how we can fix it. Right, yeah. The, uh, the the snowstorm isn't necessarily a partisan. <laughs> oh, oh, burn a bridge. Character just go either. burn a bridge. You know, it'll 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 show you how quickly, uh, it, it, you know, how vulnerable our infrastructure crew right. is. Right. Oh, ex exactly. Yeah. 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 It's uh, you, you're talking about, and this is sort of beside the point, yeah. but you know, I have you here. Um, smart growth and regulation. Mm -hmm. Regulation's a dirty word, um, in your party. Um, or supposed to be, yeah, anyway. Yeah. One of, one of the shibboleths, anyway. Yeah. How do you work smart smart growth <laughs> regulations in with you know, transportation modernization efforts? It, it, it causes me a lot of internal conflict. Because mm -hmm. I'm a property rights guy. Sure. You buy a piece of property, you ought to be able to do what you want. If you want to take that tree down, take that tree down. It's your tree. Figure it out. <laughs> uh, but in, in, in today's world, that's not practical politics. Uh, in Sandy Springs... We love our trees so much that we now hold funerals for one when it dies. It's, uh, you know, if you want to get somebody upset, go cut some trees down. 
Uh, and I get it because that you know when you live in when, when we were a rural society and growing up in r rural parts of the South, particularly, your nearest neighbor was a half a mile or a mile away in many cases. What you did didn't bother them so much. If you wanted to go out and shoot your gun and do some target practice, they could hear it, but they weren't being awake at night, you know. When you live cheek by jowl in an urban environment, you begin to have to start regulating behavior a little bit differently. Right. And it's caused me a lot of, because I'm pretty much a live and let live kind of guy, that's been the hardest part for me to, from a practical point of view, reconcile. But I've come to understand that if, that what it, my rights end at my property line, but what I am doing on my my property oftentimes will extend to my neighbor's property sure. because we're so close, and that now my behavior on my property has to be to some degree regulated so that I don't infringe on my neighbor's ability to enjoy their property. So that creates a different environment uh, that we have to deal with today uh, because we're living in such close proximity. Uh, and we have to, to be, so the balance, it's, it's, it's a balancing act. How do you preserve people's right to enjoy their own property, do what mm -hmm. they want to do? I like to sit in my hot tub and listen to music. Well, I can't turn the music up so loud that I'm disturbing my neighbors, right. you know. Uh, and they can't do the same thing, or at least I can't do it at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so uh, w we've just gone through a process in Sandy Springs where we've redone our land use plans and look at how mm -hmm. we do development regulation and and. and you know, Houston that has no zoning. You know, they have a different model there. Yeah, but you know, very topical. Very, but they're flat. They can build more roads. They can just keep expanding roads. We can't do that, and we can't you know, because of the topography that we face. The practicality of doing that is, is, is not there. So we have to start figuring out how we do things a little bit different. And those of us who are conservatively, I, I am right of center. I'm more center today than I am right, but still right of center. Sure. Um, we have to adapt. We have to realize that the days of you know, your neighbor being a mile away and you've got a lot more flexibility and freedom to do with what you want to do is different. And our laws are going to have to evolve to reconcile that. We're going to have to look at life a little bit different. And it's going to create changes in our politics. Since we're talking about adapting, what's the biggest danger imperiling the Republican majority in this state? Ah, uh, hubris. Hubris in politics is always fatal. It is, it is not something that you can survive. If you feel like that, what, that you know all the answers, that the way you're doing things is the only way to do it, uh, and uh, that, that things are not going to change, then you're being foolish. And that's what hubris leads to. Uh, that kind of arrogant, self centered thinking, and, and both parties have to get away from that. And we've got terminal cases of that in both parties today. Only we're right. I've always said, this is how I've always described the parties. The Democrats have the wrong answers to the right questions, and the Republicans have the right answers to the wrong questions. <laughs> so you need to get the folks with the right questions and the right answers together to solve problems. And uh, that's unbelievably difficult to do because we have this it's my way or the highway attitude uh, in politics. I mean I learned a lot from Jack about bipartisanship. Uh, he was a very partisan guy when it came to, po to policy. Right. But he told me when I came to Georgia he said I know you're going back to run for office I will uh, come down and support you in anything you want to do with one exception. If you run against John Lewis, I will come down and campaign against you. And he was serious. He loved John Lewis. He had friendships on the Democratic Party, people that he respected, not, not agreed with right, right, politically, but he respected them. And uh, they had a right to their opinions. They had different life experiences than he had. And those were, in his opinion, valuable to the process. And so... Um, that's kind of the attitude. When I, when I went to, the, I had a challenge when I went to the Senate because I had been seen as this partisan warrior. You know, I was chairman, the chairman of the party. party. And Mark Taylor, who was the lieutenant governor at the time, I went in to see him, and he went right at me. He said, are we going to be running against each other two years from now? I said, Mark, I just got here. And I'd known Mark for a long time. I used to go bird hunting down Albany and see him all the time. 
I said, I just got here. He said, well, how are you going to play it? Are you going to be a partisan war? Are you going to try and get along and, and get things done? I said, Mark, I'm very adaptable to my job description. My job description as party chairman is going to win elections. My job as a state senator is to come down here and try and get things done. But I'm in the minority. You're going to be more of a determinant of what I do around <laughs> here than I am. And then he kind of calmed down. And I knew going in that I was going to be looked at with a huge amount of suspicion by the, by the majority. So I would sit in the anteroom when things were slow on the floor and just build friendships. I went to Jack Hill, who was a senator. When we did some, when Sonny switched, he thought he could bring about eight senators with him. One of them was Mark Taylor. He'd made a bad miscalculation yeah. about that one. <laughs> uh, but we did some polling, and, and my, my pollster was John McLaughlin, and we did these guys, and he came in and did the presentation. Most of them could win as Republicans, and he got through the whole list, and he said, I said, you didn't, you didn't tell me about Jack Hill. What's, what's the story with Jack Hill? He said, Jack Hill's simple. Jack Hill can run as a Democrat. Jack Hill can run as a Republican. Jack Hill can run as a communist and get elected in his district. They love him down there. So when I got to the Senate, one of the first things I did was sit down in the chair beside uh, Jack and tell him that story. And I said, Jack, I want you to teach me how to be that kind of senator. Now, my career was only two years long, so I didn't get to, I didn't get to go to class very long. But, <laughs> you know, those were the kinds of things that um, I tried to do is emulate what Jack did when he was in the Congress, and, and, and it, it stood him in good stead. I, I'll never forget. I went in to see Barney Frank, of all people. I did congressional relations at HUD, and, I had to go, and he was a ranking Democrat on our committee, and so right. I had to work with him quite a bit. And uh, he, was, he was a tough guy to deal with, and, uh, but he was very easy for us because he liked Jack. They didn't agree on a, a lot of stuff, but mm -hmm. he, he liked Jack. He liked his approach to dealing with problems. And so he would work with us. And I learned an awful lot about that kind of attitude. You can be partisan. You can be focused on the right kind of policies, but you don't have to make it personal. Mm -hmm. uh, you can build friendships uh, and res have respect for differing points of views. You go fight for what you believe in, but you can respect the f their, their viewpoint. You just have to support it. Do you think the partisanship is as bad in Georgia in, under the Gold Dome as it is in Washington? No, no, and I don't think, it, it, it wasn't as bad when I was there. Like I say, I built, I, I, I built a lot of Democratic friendships, people like George Hooks, Nadine Thomas, uh, <laughs> uh, people like Vincent Ford. Vincent was Vincent my Ford. seatmate. Vincent was my seatmate. You, you, I, I told him one day, we were sitting there, we'd have great, great debates back on that row. <laughs> Because we didn't we didn't agree from anything. I said, Vincent, you've heard the you've heard the, the saying, "You're my brother from another mother." I said, "You're my brother from another planet." <laughs> we, you know, that's how far apart we were. But we could respect each other. And I see him on the in the floor the, on, on the Senate. We hug. We talk. How's your health? How's everything? You can you can fight politically without this and and be successful mm -hmm. without having all this hyper partisanship. But again, it's a reflection of who we are as a people. It's the, it's the impact of social media. It's the impact of talk radio. Uh, used to, you'd go complain over your back door fence. Now you get on Facebook, and <laughs> in your fence, you're talking to one person. Now you can go to the, the, the Facebook fence, and you can find thousands of people who... Or Twitter. Uh, yeah, or, uh, who, who... Millions, in some cases, uh, who share your same views, and they all get together now, and this is, they, they create their own little world. And it makes it very difficult to govern. You can only govern if you have a consensus. Do you think that explains 2016, uh, yeah. Donald yeah. Trump's election? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it'll explain 2020. <laughs> and it'll explain 2024. The only way you break out of this, sadly, I've come to the conclusion, is you're going to have to have some catastrophe that forces the people to understand that we're all in the same boat. And we, have, we, we may not agree on everything, but we do... We we got to we got to work this out together, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it's going to be. I mean, we went through this. You know, we've, we this is not the first time we've done this. I mean, the oh, no. presidential election of eighteen hundred between Adams and, and and Jefferson is probably one of the most partisan, divisive elections between two personal friends. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we haven't picked up guns and started shooting at each other like we did in, after the eighteen sixty election. Uh, but it's going to take something cataclysmic, I'm afraid, to get us focused back on this common American, we're common American theme and feeling. Instead of, this is my America, 
and I, this is the way I want my America to operate, and everybody in my America, which is from sea to shining sea, has to operate my way. It just will never work politically, and it's, it's a recipe for disaster. So it sounds like you're not endorsing, but you know, falling in line with the thought that you know, it, it's not going to be demographic change or no, something no, like that no. here in Georgia or, no. or national. Democrat, the Democratic Party that's, that's relying on demographic changes, now that, I'm not going to say, I'm, not, I'm saying that they don't, they don't play a role because they do. Mm -hmm. uh, ident identity politics is, a, is another thing that the Democrats have latched on that I think is it, it, way unhealthy for the country. But look at the 76 and 80 elections. In 76, mm -hmm. evangelicals supported Jimmy Carter overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. Four years later, they supported Ronald Reagan overwhelmingly. Demographic groups, of, you know, ideological groups like that can shift based on mistakes and the, and, and, and the philosophy of the governing party. So if you're relying strictly on that, if you don't have a message, if you cannot create hopes and aspirations in people, I mean, there's two ways to go. You can... You can drive wedges, you can, you can demonize the other people, or you can try and bring people together and give everybody a common vision and a common hope. That was one of the things about Reagan. Reagan, in his farewell address, said something that I thought was very important. I have always tried to appeal to your higher aspirations. Wow. Shouldn't we all be doing that? Isn't that what politics should be about? Uh, and today... There's nobody talking that way. There's nobody that I see in the political world today who is really appealing to those aspirations. Kasich did a little bit of it in, in the last election, but you see how far he got. Well, he might, he, he might be making a... I, I know what he's up to, and I'm not sure that you can pull that off. Third parties in this country really don't work. Well, I, I, was, I, was, I was thinking more of a primary challenge to well, a you know, sort of... but, the, you know, he's looking at putting together a, a, a center... Yeah, a, a center... With, with, with John Hickenlooper yeah. of Colorado. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've watched... Historically speaking, no, it, that no, does it's not. Never, it's never worked. Not work. This is a two-party country, and that's not to say that the existing two parties will last forever. Or in the form that right. they are, they are, are today. Currently. I mean, right. they're, they're, the parties are, are li living creatures. They evolve. They realign. They realign. As Things happen. But, but you, you, if, if you're not out there looking for a message, I mean, it's one, you say what you want to about Trump. Mm -hmm. He had a message. Right. I'm going to make this country great again. Very simple, very he, it, he came at it from a different perspective than Reagan did. He wasn't always appealing to our higher aspirations, but he was appealing to that aspiration of we want to be a successful great, respected country. I want my life to be better than it is. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he gave that hope in a perverse sort of way. Uh, and that's what people latch on to in politics. Now, do you, I think that's, uh, clearly it was a very effective uh, message for a challenger, mm -hmm. yeah, non-incumbent. Right, it's easier to do that from the outside. In 2020, um, you know, that, that's, I guess we're getting into the realm of prognostication now. <laughs> where, 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 do, where do the Democrats go from here? If they go the Elizabeth Warren route, I can't buy, I can't. You know, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, that wing of the party, they're not going to unify this country. Okay. Um, I don't know who did. It's interesting that Clinton was really the last president we had who, who who had the ability to unify. The biggest argument my dad and I ever had in politics was I made the argument that Bill Clinton was a more conservative president than uh, Richard Nixon. I mean, Nixon took us off the gold standard, ASHA, EPA, all these, you know, he was just, the, he was just Lyndon Johnson and the Kennedy Johnson administration's third term in a lot of ways. <laughs> he talked conservatively, but he governed. He had, he had Daniel Moynihan right. there. Right, he had no far health. to the, he, he <laughs> governed pretty well to the left. Clinton balanced the budget. He worked an accommodation with Gingrich, and and so um, that's really the he was a divisive figure personally, sure. mm -hmm. but politically he he was able to pull some pull people together and get them to work together. He was really the last president that I've seen who had the ability to bring people together and get problems solved. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to do that since, uh, and it's not going to happen. I don't think over the over the next four years, and I'll have a difficult time looking into the next administration with the personalities that are involved to figure out how that's going to happen. Hopefully somebody comes. Hopefully somebody comes up and changes the tenor of the election. I'm hopeful. 
What about, what about here in Georgia? We, we're coming up on a big election, 2018. Um, Are Republicans going to nominate a born and bred Republican? For the first this time, time? A, 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 a lifelong Republican governor? We've never had one. We've, not, even, <laughs> not even Rufus Bulk. There, there was no Republican We've never party. had uh, what I would call a, a DNA Republican. Right. Uh, that's not to say that Sonny and Nathan have not governed. Oh, sure, they've, sure. They've, 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 been, they've governed as Republicans, but they, weren't, they, they came from the Democratic Party. I think they will. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, is who's that going to be? And what are the policies and what are the messages? Where do we go from here, I think, is the biggest question that the Republican Party, not only nationally, but Georgia has to face. What kind of state do we want to create? Where do we want to go from here? Because even though, as I said earlier, you know, all we did was over the last 40 years was change the labels. Politics, the, the, these, the kids that are coming into the world today and beginning to take leadership, <clears throat> you know, I sat and listened to my grandmother tell stories about her, her grandfather who was, who was in, at Gettysburg. My kids can't even spell Gettysburg. I mean, it's not even in their realm of, of uh, consciousness. Mm -hmm. My generation probably got the, is the, of Southerners, the last one with that real rooted connection into the old South who grew up under those same kind of conditions. The kids today have, t you know, they're, they're, they're digital natives and their perspectives, they're, they're much more live and let live, very libertarian in their approach. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, they want a good life. Uh, but it's going to be a totally different message to those folks. And the party that gets there first, that really captures their imagination, is going to be the one that dominates the 21st century. And our party needs the message. I'm not sure where it's coming from. It's, it can be rooted in the tradition. There's nothing wrong with tradition. I mean, Burke, if you go read Burke and, and, and uh, Russell Kirk and Buckley. I didn't think we'd be talking about Edward <coughs> Burke today. Yeah, but. so... You know, sure. th their, their messages are relevant. You just got to adapt them to 21st century situations. But neither party's doing a very good job of, of, of holding up something that our kids feel, uh, you know, they can, they can aspire to. And that's the struggle that both parties have. Where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. And both parties are having to grapple with that. Um, I mean, I've got my ideas, but uh, I'm not going to be running for office in 2018. I'm in my last last term of my last election. Qualifying elected doesn't end until April. You're, I know, but I'm done. This, I'm, I'm in my last rodeo. I'm riding into the sunset. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, we've got to have a message that appeals to these young people, mm -hmm. that give them hope and, and, and appeal to their aspirations for their lives. And I'm not sure that either party's really paying particular attention to them right now. Uh, the Republicans are looking backward. They're still trying to hold on to a declining base that's dominated by white conservative males in the right. main. That's right. a shrinking asset. That's why the Democrats think that the demographics are on their side. Um, but, but the Democrats aren't doing anything to, to, to make the current generation of, of young Georgians feel real positive about where they're going either. They're not turned on by identity politics. Uh, they don't look at the world like we've always looked at it as black and white and this and that. They're much more tolerant and they don't let extraneous things get in their way. So if you're trying to talk to them on that level, you're going to end up talking past them. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, both parties have got to sit down and rethink what their message for the 21st century is because both of them are still stuck to some degree in the last part of the 20th, 20th century. We haven't adapted to what's going on in the 21st century yet. Do you think that, you know, you're Republican obviously, but talking about the Democratic side, you have the two Stacys, Stacey Abrams and Stacey Evans. Do you think that race, regardless of the ideas and the policies, do you think it is or will be decided primarily on, on, on racial identity? Well, I can tell G you, given the, the I can tell you the, the way that 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 conference in Atlanta played out where Stacey we're, Evans we're was the, booed. Uh, Net Roots Conference. Yeah, Net Roots Conference. Uh, that, told, that told me that the Democrats are nowhere close to being able to take the majority of the state uh, because if, if, if they are into identity politics and old-style racial politics, then they're stuck in the 20th century too. 
That's not what that's not what people are interested in anymore. Maybe the people you hang out with politically, that's what they're talking about. Mm. That's the danger of what I talked about, hubris. You're only talking to your to to like minded people and you think I had a great story. My dad told me one time when, when Clinton was running for election, Bill Clinton can't get reelected. I said, what do you mean, <laughs> Dad? How, what, what makes you think that? He said, well, nobody that I talk to is going to vote for Clinton. I said, well, Dad, your life is the church and the barbershop. <laughs> and you, you got a group of other guys that you hang out. None of them are. I said, there are more people live on one block of New York City than live all the, than in the entire county that you live in. I said, and that's when you start, you only talk to the people who agree with you then you're missing out on the big picture. It's the old uh, uh, prob or, 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 or metaphor where if you're blind guys feeling the Indians feeling the, the elephant and they're, one's holding the leg, one's holding the trunk, you have totally different descriptions of what the elephant looks like. None of them are based in reality. And if you just simply get together with a small group of people and that becomes your reality, you're missing out on the big picture. And that's what's going on in politics right now is everybody's talking, they're talking to people who agree with them and so they think that's what reality is. Right. And they can find on the internet thousands of other people who agree with them. So they think that just simply, you know, there's a guy in, in Massachusetts who agrees with me. And uh, so it's got to be going on all over the country. And that's when you make terrible mistakes in politics. And there's a lot of that that's happening right now. So what do you, what do you think you know, Georgia politics looks like 10, 20 years from now? Is it going to be a Republican-dominated state, white males in, in every constitutional office and super no, majorities? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, Georgia is, Georgia went through this transition, as, a, as we talked earlier, from the, from the mid 1960s that accelerated in the 70s and culminated in the 90s. Politics is not static, it's dynamic, it's changing constantly. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the electorate, it, it, is, 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 is going to be totally different 10 years from now. It's the, it's the old adage, you never step in the same river twice. You never, you know, the biggest mistake you, you make is, is uh, running the last election. Mm -hmm. And generals fight the last war, political consultants fight the last election. And you've got to try and figure out, looking into the future, is, it's not a clear vision, but you've got to try and figure out, well, kind of what are the trends, what are the opportunities, and you've got to try and make yourself available to them. And how do you capitalize on them? And what is the message that you can create out of that that inspires and motivates people to go the direction you want them to go? That's what leadership is. That's what the parties are intended to, that's their purpose, is to provide that kind of leadership for either the city, the county, the state, the country, the world. And, uh, and, and we've got to get back to trying to figure out where, where we want this country to go. Where we want, where, that's my job. Where do, where, where do we want the city to go? What do we want it to be like 10 years from now? And you got to have a vision on how you do that. Well, we just need some, we need some dreamers and visionaries <laughs> and, and some people who know how to communicate that. Right. And you think, do you think either party right now has an upper hand? No, no. Both parties could collapse or both parties, if they get the right kind of leadership and get the right kind of message, can thrive. We're at, a, we're at a key breaking point. How much longer do the existing two parties hold the confidence of the mass of the American public at a time when nothing is getting done? They're going to, they're going, I mean, the, the Whig Party failed because they couldn't figure out how to deal with the issue of slavery. Now you're talking my language. Yeah, yeah we're, back, right we're back in your area again. Oh, no, no. Uh, is, uh, and, 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 and that's, that's when parties fail, is when they don't adapt to changing circumstances and situations. And uh, we're a two-party uh, system, but that doesn't mean it's existing two parties. I don't know how it's going to shake out. Uh, if I did, I'd, I'd, I'd invest more money in the stock market. <laughs> but uh, but it, is, it is got to change. Uh, the, the American people are going to demand it. We've got too many problems that have got to be solved. They're going to demand change. Do you think that's, um, I don't know, the catalyst isn't the right word, but the, the real issue that is going to gall most people is even in the 1960s where we had uh, you know, a lot of crime at mm -hmm. its historic levels. Yeah. We, we talk about high crime now. It was yeah. nothing, nothing like, like the, it was the 60s, um, early 70s. Um, Tensions with civil rights, anti-war protesters, the new left, the you know, mm -hmm. things like that. But the governing institutions still 
worked. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you had new policy. Yeah. You had well, bipartisan compromise. Well, we've through periods where it didn't work. I mean, sure. you, go, you look at the president's ahead of Abraham, between Andrew Jackson no, well, yeah. <laughs> and, and Abraham Lincoln. We had some pretty, we had a few duds. The, you know? the, the, the Franklin Pierce's and Pierce's James, and James Buchanan's, Buchanan's of the world. world. They, right, yeah. they weren't stellar performers either. So we've gone through this period before. And, and survived. That's not a very hopeful message. No, I know, we're I, know about Pierce, I know. Pierce and Buchanan here. <laughs> but no, no I, I think that's maybe the, you've been talking around the issue the whole time, I think, is, is faith in institutions. Not well, just governing institutions, yeah, but all institutions. The media so, is so, an yeah, the media, the, the media is contributing to this. Edward R. Murrow said when the news department becomes a profit center, it'll no longer be the news department. And he was right. I mean, if you look at, at cable news today, I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist. I, that's my background. Right. And, and I have no place where I can go. To get, I can form my own opinions if you just give me the facts. All I get to listen to nowadays on talk radio, which is basically news radio and, and cable news, is other people's opinions of what is important. Uh, sure. And I may or may not agree with them. And now I have to channel surf and look at these different opinions to try and figure out where the real facts are in the middle. And that's the, the, the news media. Has, is, uh, I've, it, as, a, as somebody who a, was a practicing journalist for the first part of my life, I think they've let us down. Uh, it's all about ratings and how you get pe eyes on, on your, your program. Mm -hmm. And the more controversial you are, the more ratings you get. But that's not healthy for governance. You can't, again, you can't govern if you don't have consensus. You got to have a consensus. There's got to be a, you're not going to get everybody on board, but you got to have more than just a bare majority. You got to have kind of a, a general sense that the public wants to go in a particular way. Then you can go. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that, let me go back and say the party that will be successful going forward is the party who understands the changed social climate with digital media and can go out and find all those little bitty realities and neighborhoods that are, are created on the on uh, social media and form it and, and figure out how to turn them into a consensus because that's where you're going to have to go to get it you can't you can't do it through one or two newspapers in the city anymore right they're not three TV stations that dominate a market. The gatekeeper, you know, so to speak. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's much more diffuse than that. Mm -hmm. And whoever figures out how to go out with a message that takes all these little villages that exist in, in cyber world and brings them together and can pull a consensus out of it is going to be the party that's successful. Find them, vote them, count them that's for it. the digital it, age. The stuff doesn't change. Human nature is immutable. The tools you use right. and how you have to use them are going to change enormously. Well, anything else you'd like to add? We, we're I mean, so, I've burned so much coast oxygen coast right thing. here. Probably none of the things that you really want to talk about. No, 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 no. This has been great. I've got old man's disease. I'll talk about what I want to talk oh. about. <laughs> this, no, this, this has been great. We went everywhere from Burke to Buchanan and, and, and everything in between. Well, I'm a student of the process, and it, right. it comes out. I read a lot, and... Uh, and, and try and, 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 re, and, and relate things that have happened in the past of, as a guideline for what's going on in the future. And that's what history is all about, right? That's absolutely. Well, it, that, that reminds me, just because you know, I, we're here. What, what's the political organization going to be like? We're, we're talking, we're a post uh, Citizens United. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're social media where everybody with a, with a, a Wi-Fi connection or a smartphone can, can organize and can you know, donate with a click. What is the purpose of a political party these days, or the political party you you came to came to join in the mid '70s, led in the mid '90s? How is how is that going to be different? It's going to. I mean, the, again, people are the same. People, human nature is going to is going to be that way until we leave this planet in whatever form we leave it in. Uh, but how you how you reach people, how you, again, the world is much more diffuse than it's ever been before. Mm -hmm. There's not one source that you can go to get information. Uh, you have to go look at a wide variety of sources. There's all these little villages and colonies that exist in, in the cyber world, and you're going to have to master those. You're going to have to, and, and you're going to have to understand how you go out. 
But sadly, some of the terrorist groups are probably doing a better job than some of the parties right now. ISIS does a tremendous uh, job of recruiting disaffected Muslim males mm -hmm. um, to their cause. Uh, we just need to be able to figure out how to do the same thing, but in a positive way, for positive ends. Uh, and, and the parties, I, you know, they, there's, they're spending a lot of money on technology and trying to figure it out, but nobody's really done it yet. Uh, uh, I mean, we've got all the, all the, you know, you slice data. Big data is a big, big feature in, in, in political campaigns today. Right, right. Trying to segment the population trying to figure out where the anomalies are. If you're looking at white males, you know, not all of them are voting Republican. Some of them are voting Democratic. Why are they anomalies to the, uh, the, the herd? Right. Why, are they, why are they going a different direction? And you try and find those and figure out what motivates them. So there's an awful lot of, of uh, big data parsing that tries to narrow cast to those, uh, to those uh, demographic groups. But that's not going to help you govern. It may help you win elections mm -hmm. when you parse everybody that way, but it's not going to help you govern because, what you, again, you've got to get a consensus to move forward, and now you've got to do the opposite of narrow casting. You've got to try to figure out how to take a narrow cast tool right. to broadband, to broad base, to broadcast. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a much more challenging world. When you could go by... A thousand basis point, or a thousand uh, uh, points in TV a week, and, and you did 17 to 20 TV stations in the state, and then you bought 15 or 20 newspapers, and you could reach 90 percent of the population. Doesn't happen. No. Uh, now you've you you you're, you've got to figure out how you take. You could you would go try and get 50 percent by taking 10, 10, 15, 20 percent of different groups. Now you got to get to 50 percent by one percent or a half a percent and that you just got the all these stratifications that you got to deal with and that's the reality of where we are and you can you can use those tools for elections but but not not for governing it's how you paste all those strata together into a consensus and nobody's nobody's figured that one out yet well that's uh, I'm trying to think of a, b a better way to uh, a, 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 a more lighthearted way to end the. What What are your your, your post elected official days plans? Uh, I'm going to finish out. I just uh, I, first time in 40 years of, of uh, public service. Uh, I don't have an opponent, so I can actually not worry about an election and start thinking about what I want to do over the next four years. Uh, I've got an idea about the kind of things I want to accomplish as mayor. I get the great thing about this job is I get to go home every day and look back. And and this week we've just had hurricane. Uh, Irma come through mm -hmm. and we've had a lot of devastation in our community and uh, I've used social media to communicate with our folks and people are very, uh, they, they're commending me on our communication skills and all that sort of stuff. I get to go home after a day like that and say, you know, you've really made a difference in people's lives today. Uh, so I want to continue that, uh, figure out two or three, you know, as, an, as, a, as a political figure, I figured out like any other manager. If you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. So pick two to four big things you want to accomplish over four years and focus on those and manage the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got those in my mind about what I want to do over the next four years. To write, Then I'm going to write off in the sunset. I've got uh, my uh, oldest grandson just celebrated his 15th birthday. I never got a chance to go on spring break with my kids the time they were growing up. I've sacrificed, they have sacrificed a lot to my political career. Uh, I want to spend time with the family. I want to get to know those grandsons. Hopefully there are more coming. Uh, and <laughs> travel. I don't get a chance to travel as much as I'd like. Uh, so um, those are my aspirations. I hope my health holds together. My mom's still alive at 91. My dad still just had his 87th birthday. So Congratulations. My, uh, that's, that's my jeans. If I, if I can bet on my jeans, I might have an opportunity to enjoy some things later in life. Uh, but you're not guaranteed. But I'd love to be able to spend more time with my uh, my family and, uh, and and see more of the world than I've been able to see. I've been fortunate, but I'd like to get out and see more of it. Well, I, I appreciate that you, you chose to came, come here, <laughs> come over to Athens and have this talk. Um, thank you for being part of the Two-Party Georgia Oral well, History Program. I'm glad to do it. And uh, if you think of any other subject that you want me to talk about, you've noticed that I have an opinion on just about everything. 
am not very shy about sharing it. So uh, I'll tell you what I think. I won't lie to you. I may be wrong, but I won't lie to you. I'll tell you what I think. Well, I, I appreciate and I expect <laughs> nothing less. Right, Thank you very much, Mayor Paul. Okay.